particular ways. But first, I want to talk about a couple of questions that, that came up on the discussion forum. Um, so somebody asked about the time to compute the heuristic. So, so if you're just like in classical search mode, and you're talking about doing A star, and you come up with a heuristic, um, does it matter how long it takes to come up with your heuristic estimate? What do you guys think? Yes. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so, so like the perfect heuristic would be to actually just solve the problem and come up with the real cost, right? So, so then you would know. Exact, it wouldn't be an estimate. It would be just the perfect thing of, of exactly what to do. But in the limit, like, like given the information you have to compute that, it's going to take as long as it would take to solve the problem in the first place. So your goal in coming up with your heuristic, a heuristic, usually you're trying to find something constant time that you can very quickly give, give, your, give yourself an estimate of, of how far it reaches the goal without actually doing all the work to figure out um, the, the true cost. You could do that work. You're actually kind of, it's kind of this meta problem. You are doing that work in, in, when you're solving a star. But um, uh, the, the, the time is important, and you want to make sure that it's fast. Otherwise, you'll, you'll be very unhappy. A star won't help you at all. All right, and then somebody else asked a question I thought was interesting um, about the projects as well. So, so they were pointing out um, sort of deduplicating the search code. Um, so this question was about how should you structure your project? Because it, these algorithms really feel very similar, uh, especially when we're talking about breadth first search and depth first search and A star. And if you guys remember when we coded it all up in class, we had that priority queue, and it just sort of depended on what we were putting in the queue as our cost function and you know, what the order of things were in order to make things um, come out in, in these different algorithms, right? So you have a choice in, in, in the way that you do it, uh, in the way that you code your projects. But I, as I wanted to emphasize, um, and the, the TA said this as well, the TA, I think Miles replied to this one. Uh, the, the TA said this as well, that it, you're encouraged to make the code as clear as possible. And it might be fewer lines of code if you did this kind of metaprogramming thing where there's a sort of one global search algorithm and you're just passing in different parameters. So maybe you're passing in different things to use for the cost function, the priority queue, and then that switches it from breadth first search to depth first search to A star search. Um, you can code it that way, but I often find it a lot easier to think about is if, if you just have it as a separate algorithm. Um, and that gives you two things. So first of all, it gives you sort of more practice in, in, in implementing these things. And, I, as you can, I, and I, have, I value practice a lot. I think the deliberate practice of coding up these algorithms is worthwhile. And it's also, I think, a nicer way to structure your code. So code reuse is overrated. I know this is maybe heretical to say to a computer science audience. But when you start to have this, this sort of master search algorithm of, of everything, what, what, what happens is you find that there's a bug or you want to add a new search algorithm to it or something else and, and you're changing it and suddenly like some, somebody else later on who's using it, just they just want to do breadth first search, let's say, and you're adding you know, A star with a fancy heuristic <coughs> estimator and, and, and new things and you just change it, you might break their breadth first search and then it's very sad. So, so this kind of dependency breaking is, is an important even though it does result in more lines of code, it decouples the dependencies and it, and it can make your code more robust in the long run. Um, the other thing I want to say about these algorithms is, is it tends to be the case that there's usually enough domain-specific mess that happens that you're ending up, it easy, it's easier to just re-implement the search anyway. So, so an example of that is, the, is what we saw in the paper last week with uh, Windows where he's actually calling out to VMware and, and stuff like that. And maybe if we were, uh, maybe it was possible to, to use some kind of generic search algorithm or something like that. But there's usually enough stuff going on that, you, that I find it simpler to just re-implement. Um, and I'm saying this because when I was um, trained as a computer scientist, I, was, I thought that, I, I think now, that I, back then I was far too biased towards code reuse. Um, and now I think it's kind of overrated. So, so don't be afraid to, to, re to have separate implementations and not make it all meta, um, even though it might feel fun to do. It is fun to do that sometimes, too. Um, OK. All right. So what we're going to talk about today is, um, this is sort of the textbook chapter, is beyond classical search. And we're going to um, spend most of our time on a, a type of, 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 of a more difficult problem, which is called, which the textbook calls online search. Um, so I forgot to take out my, my appears. So this is just the classical search. Um, how we formalize the problem of, of classical search. 
So, um, so the difference between online search and classical search really boils down to the situation where um, in classical search, we're given the map, right? So we know in advance all of the, the, all of the connections between the cities and the costs to, go, to get to those cities. We're at, and, and we're trying to find the shortest path from, say, Arad to Bucharest. Um, whereas in online search, we're not given the map in advance. So we don't know the map. We don't know what other cities connect to Arad unless we're actually in that state. Then we can, then if we're actually there, we can figure out which other actions are, um, are, are, are possible from that, from that state. So you can really think of it as, as if your agent is physically <laughs> walking around the search space. So, so an analogy is like a robot is actually physically walking around an environment or your little guy is flying or taking trains or something. And he's physically in a rod and only in a rod can he see the outgoing connections. Um, just one link away, yes. If you had been in a rod, could you know what's in, where a rod goes to? Well, you might know the outgoing actions, but, but if you take an action, so let's say that there, there's three actions here. You can, do, you can go to Zurin, you can go to Cebu, you can go to Timi, Soara. Um, you, you might know that you could go to each of those. You only know that you can, only go, to, you can go to those three cities. But, once you, but you don't know at the beginning, if you did go to Zurin, what you could do after that. Yes? Yeah, I mean, yeah, like, let's say you go to Zurin. Yeah. Then would you rem remember that from Arad you could go mm -hmm. to Ch Cebu? Right. So, 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 so we'll talk about, yes, exactly. So, so, so in order to do intelligent things in, in uh, the situation, you have to have memory. You have to basically build a map of the environment. And what we'll talk about is algorithms for, for how you do that. Yes? In classical search algorithms, you, like, um, you only add the successes to your current node, and then you don't do anything with those successes for currently. So how is that different than that? Um, I, I actually, I'm going to show a classical search example, and we'll, talk, we'll, we'll see exactly where it breaks down. Right. Um, so can I postpone your question? Yeah. Like three, it's probably going to be like five minutes, but, but we'll get to it. OK. Anybody else? OK. All right. So here's, your, here's the answer to your question. So what we're going to do, I'm just going to rerun our informed search.py. Let me make this big again. All right, so this guy is running A star. Oh, sorry, I have to stop my slides from being displayed. Sorry about that. So, so this guy, this is from a couple classes ago when we were doing A star, and I'm just going to hit enter. And every time I hit enter in my little terminal, it's going to explore another node. So here, it's going from here to here, and then it's going to jump up there, and then it's going to find the goal. And it's A star, so you can see it, it, it figured out it didn't want to take that big detour. It was <coughs> going to go up and explore um, this, this node up here on top. So, so what's the problem with this in, a, in an online setting? Yes? Does it jump backwards? You actually have to take two steps. Right? Exactly. So, so when we were here, let me run it again so we can see. So when we were here, what we did is, is we did this teleportation. Right? So if we were a real robot and we, went, we, we, we turned our little motors and we trundled our little selves over here, and then we said, oh, we don't like this node, I want to go back up to, to this node, which is what A star says to do. I, if I'm a real robot, I can't do that without, I, can, I can't teleport, right? Like we, we haven't figured that one out yet. So, so I have to actually go back here and then go, go up here. And if I'm paying a cost every time I traverse a node, then there's a cost for doing that backtracking. And my A star search isn't taking that cost into account. Does that make sense? It's Does finding a solution for like a future trip instead of doing the trip as it goes. That's right. Yeah. So, I'm, so, so I could do this. Like, like, I, like if A star says, like right now, I'd really like to take a look at this node, then I could kind of trundle back up here and trundle up here. And, and, um, and, and, and I would probably eventually get to the goal. However, the, the, the problem is that I might be, waste, I might be able to do much better because I'm, I'm doing this backtracking without really thinking about the best way to do it. And I've already kind of invested something in going down this road. So maybe even though the optimal shortest path is, is, is to go up in this direction, I might actually spend less cost in my exploration if I, if, I, if I took that detour. So it might make more sense for me to try to keep exploring 
instead of backtracking. Does that make sense? It might not. I don't know. So like, like th that's one of the challenges of this type of um, search is that I have to kind of explore and figure, figure out what's going to happen. So, so making these decisions is, is challenging because you're, you're trying to figure out based on your past history of observation. So, so what this is getting um, closer and closer towards is, is what we're going to talk about at the very end of the semester, which is reinforcement learning. Um, where I'm making a sequence of decisions over time in an unknown environment and I'm trying to figure out uh, what, what's, what, uh, what I should do in order to uh, get the most, to reach my goal mo in the most efficient way. And what we're talking about here, we're kind of, uh, what I'm going to talk about in, in class today is, is, is sort of two different relaxations or changes to the search problem that get us a little bit closer on the spectrum towards reinforcement learning. We're not actually going to get there till the end of the semester because I want to do more probability. But we're going to talk uh, before we, we cover it formally. But like, I wanted to sort of show you how there's kind of the spectrum of this road that we can go down from classical search to get to reinforcement learning. OK, good? All right. All right, so here is our uh, classical search. So initial state S, set of actions A, transition model, uh, which is our result function, our goal test, and, and our path cost. So now what I want to talk about is what is it actually, so, so I've sort of given the intuition about what online search looks like. What does that correspond to in terms of formalizing it? So if I want to change this to be online search, what do I have to do? And maybe what you guys can do now is like turn to, each, turn to your, your partner, turn to somebody who's sitting next to you, and have a little conversation about what you think needs to change in this picture in order to make it go from classical search to online search. Go. Right, about 10 more seconds. All right, guys, why don't we come back? And does anybody want to share your answers? Yes. You need, uh, in, you need intermediate uh, states where you can stop and then take action to get. You need, you need intermediate states where you take action from your initial state or any other intermediate state to reach additional ones. And then you need to reassess all your options with your start state no longer being the origin of all of your calculations for cost, whatever place you are currently is now your, is now your, uh, your new start state for each intermediate. So I think what you're talking about is some of the bookkeeping that you need to do in order to build up a map of the environment. Is that, is that? I can only assume so. Yeah. No? <laughs> I, I, think, I think that's kind of what you're talking about. I'm, I'm more interested in almost in something a little more basic, which is what, it, what, what like if we want to just make a list of what we need to define an online search problem, what, is, what, what, what does that list have to be? In the back there. Um, doesn't path cost need to make consistency, like keep track of, like, not just the path that is being built, but how you got to build that path? Yeah, so, so I might not actually know the path cost until I've transitioned from one state to another state. So, so I don't get to jump around like I did in A star and just kind of know the path cost. I have to actually be there. So that's one thing. What else? Yeah. Uh, like you don't have the transition model? Yeah, you don't have the transition model. Yes. So did I, did I do this right? No, I'm going backwards. Yes. So the big thing is the transition model. I think I should have also crossed out path cost. Um, because you don't have that in advance of, of solving the problem. Yes? But you still have a transition model for a limited transition model for your current state, or no? Yeah, so you know the set of actions that you can take in right, your current you state. You don't know where you'll be, or no? You don't, you know, don't know where you'll be. So that's what the transition model tells you. If you start taking the road to like Zorinth or whatever, you'll, you'll get there and be like, oh, I'm in Zorinth. Oh, you, know, you, you wouldn't know, you know, you know, know You don't even know you're going to Zorinth. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Foreign country, man. You know. <laughs> I don't know. Usually it's like. It just tells you. You just tell like stop the next stop. Use. Okay, yeah. 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 We don't read street signs. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I, it's kind of like when I, I, if you've ever been, if you, if you don't read Chinese, I, I was, this reminds me of the time when I was in Beijing, and you're trying to take the bus somewhere, and you're illiterate. Like, I'm illiterate because I don't speak Chinese. As I'm sure some of you guys do, and you're not illiterate. And you're just completely mystified. Like, there's all these buses, and you, the only way you can find out where they go is to get on and take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, Karthik. Um, like, What's that? Yeah, well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about next. So, so why don't we why don't we do that? So, um, so what I so so the, so so what I want to do is write a little bit of code to talk about which action to take. So, um, I'm going to pull up a chair so I can sit while I type. All right, and, and, and the algorithm we're going to spend the, the most time on and talk about this is, is called online depth first search. So, uh, sorry, I got, I got the, not the one that I, the one that I practiced on, not the one that it's empty. So the way that the pseudocode for this um, works in the book is a little bit different from the previous search algorithms. I shouldn't have made this bigger. Put it in. All right. So the way that the, the book um, does the search algorithm is a little bit different from the template that we had from before, where we were we basically had the search and we were keeping up our our active set from from before. Actually, I'll pull that up so we can look at it. Um, so we had our search, and this is, this is our, our search algorithm from before. It's doing a star. So we've got this priority queue, and then we're just pulling stuff <coughs> off the queue uh, right here. And then we're putting new things in the queue, and then we're, we're going off and, and doing it again until our, our set of active nodes is empty. And, 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 and the, the input is a graph, and the output is our trajectory through the environment, and, and, and hopefully it's the right thing, or, or maybe the, the goal state. Um, so, so the way that to think about this is a little bit different, because the magic in, in the bookkeeping is, is really hidden inside this function that they, they call choose, they don't, I call it choose action. So, so what, you're, what you basically have to do is you're at a, a particular state. So you just went from state S, you took action A, and that got you to state S1. And you have as input your goal, and then it went to a bookkeeping cell. So you went and talked about that. And what you have to return is um, your um, S prime, it's basically for bookkeeping, and then the, the next action that you're going to take in this environment. And what we have to think about in, in these online searches is, is like what is the way that we're going to choose the action? So um, what is one way we could choose our action? What's a really simple thing we could do? I like to start with something really simple. Pick a random action. Pick the first one. Pick a random action. Pick the first action. Yeah. So let's do that. You got it. Maybe that was cheating because I, I just commented that, that one right out. So, so um, what's that? <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. All right, so we're going to take a random action. So this is just going to sort of bounce us randomly around the search space. So let's run it and see what it does. So I made a, the graph a little bit more complicated with some dead ends so we could kind of see uh, as, it, as it explores. So our random action is just going to kind of randomly bounce around. All right, so, so the red is showing our current state, and it's doing no memory of where it's been, so it's happy to, to revisit these states. And there's not like hill climb or anything like that, and you know, almost got there. No. And eventually, if we run it long enough, hopefully, it'll actually reach the goal state. There. But we didn't put a goal test in, so it's not even, <laughs> it's not even doing that. Um, so if we wanted to do better with, um, with this, we could keep a history of the different actions that we've explored. And then um, you know, what, what, what could we do with that history? Yeah? Is it undoing 
yeah, we could prefer unvisited nodes more. Um, what else could we do? With our heuristic, let's say we have a heuristic, yeah. When choosing a random action, not just a random action from the node you're currently in, but just from a node you visited before that's like a node that branches out from that node that you visited before? So like maybe like allow backtracking between just two or three nodes to go back to another state, another node? Yeah, so like if there was a node and there was like five places to go from there and you went one way, maybe you want to go back to that node and try some of those other places, right? So, so, so keep tracking, keeping track of maybe the... Maybe you don't want to yeah. backtrack until you've exhausted yeah. that random node that you first picked. Yeah, right. So, so maybe I want, to, I want to completely explore where I've been so I don't waste the time. Otherwise, I'll be like doing a lot of extra th kind of thrashing, backtrack backing and, backtrack and forth. Again. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so if I go back to my slides, um, we're, so we're going to talk about a version <coughs> of doing that, which is called online depth first search, and, and, and code that up. So, so here's the pseudocode for it, and it's a lot of, of if statements doing this kind of with these persistent things, and without going into the, to the, the details, like we will when, when, when we code it up. But without yet going into the details, what all, those, what all these lists and tables are basically doing is keeping track of where there's places I haven't explored. And, and just try and, 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 and you know, where I am in terms of the search space and, and <coughs> trying to prevent me from revisiting these places again. So, so it's doing that bookkeeping. So why, we talk, we're going to talk about depth first search. Why, what, what would it mean to do a breadth first search with this problem? <coughs> Yeah. Like yeah. It would kind of spiral. It'd be. Would it be good or bad? Like, would we like that? I think it would be awful because you'd need to backtrack a lot. Yeah, you'd be doing an awful lot of backtracking. So, so here's a situation where breadth first search is not going to really work for us. We're kind of stuck with depth first search because we want to. Like, we don't want to have to spend all of our time. Like, like we basically come back to the start node and go to the next level like a lot. Can you, can you kind of see the, the little guy like, okay, I went down one level, I'm going to go back to Arad, now I'm going to go to Zebu and then come back to Arad. And then only then it's going to go again down that first path and expand all those nodes and, and, and keep going until it, it uh, got to the goal. So it would build a map of the environment, but it would visit the home node a lot. And, and w um, the, the point of doing uh, depth first search is, is basically we'll completely explore something before we come back and, and check the unexplored nodes. Okay, so here is the, and I also before we, we go, so we're going to basically change this guy to, to be the pseudocode that um, the book gives here. So, so the, um, unlike the, the pseudocode from before where it's breadth first search, um, what it's actually returning at every time step is the next action that you should take based on doing all that bookkeeping. So, there, so you actually have to, to make this run, you have to write this outer loop. Um, so, so, so choose action is where this pseudocode is, is going to end up. You have to write an outer loop to actually do the breadth first search. And, I'm, and I wrote that already, so, you, so we don't have to <coughs> do too much bookkeeping here. Depth first. depth first search, yes, thank you. Yes? Does this make the assumption that you can go back? Yes. Like, it's not like you, draw, you can't, like, there's only a bus out, you can never get back. Yeah, what happens if you can't go back? <coughs> yeah, you're gonna, your little robot's gonna, like, like, let's say there's a stairway, and it goes down the stairs, and it can't go back, like, it falls, <coughs> and then it can't go back up the stairs, you right? You can't go back the way you came. Yeah. You, you assume, like, if you just rode the train, that would, there's a train back. At some point? Yes. So, so this, this algorithm assumes that that there's a way back. And it's actually, um, like this line here, this, which is kind of, this actually confused me for a while this morning when I was implementing this. An action B such that result of S prime of B equals pop on backtrack S. That's actually, that's actually math for the action that takes me back to where I was. So I have to be able to do that, or else the, the search won't fail. The search will fail. All right. All right, sorry about the, mic, the AV troubles. All right, so I wanted to show you guys the structure of this. So, so, all, so, so what it's doing is making a bunch of, of variables. And then at every time step, we're, we're getting the next state and the action that we're choosing. And then uh, if you turn on when you want to stop. And then we are drawing up here this, this plot line. 
is drawing that uh, state, so that is putting in, the, in our graph that <coughs> big red dot of where we are, and then we do it again. So we're just going to keep calling this over and over and over until we get to the goal. Um, where's the goal test? Where's the goal test? Good question. So here's how I call it. Um, so I have a start, which is 0, 0, and a goal, which is 8, 0. And I call it with the graph, which is like the, the state space. So, it, so, so it's kind of, don't get confused by the fact that I'm giving it the graph. Like, so in, this is essentially a simulation of what the search is really doing. Like, be, you know, I could, this, is, this is a similar graph to what I was using to do breadth first search where we really could jump. So, so even though we, in our virtual computer world, can jump from one node to another node in this graph, and we could do A star, we're going to limit ourselves to, to use this as a model for the, the harder problem of our, of our robot. Does that make sense? OK, so we have our online DFS graph start goal. And that um, comes up if we go up here. Um, that, that enters into this loop of here's my start node, and I'm going to every time step pick an action. Or every step, I'm going to pick an action and then move to the next state and keep going until I reach the goal. So I have a goal test that my state equals the goal state. If I wanted to, I could do like a subset or something like that, but just to simplify it, there's just one goal state. All right, so here is our choose action function. And maybe I'll, I'll do the thing I did last time. We can put the the code up and the Emacs window at the same time. And let's not do random. Let's do something else. So what should we do first? Yeah? Well, right. So if our, if our, if uh, SP, so here SP is S prime in the math. SP equals goal. Then let's return. So what we're going to do to stop is just return none for the state and, and the next action. Um, all right. Now what? So what's the next line in the, in the pseudocode? Here it is. So it says, if s prime is a new state, which means it's not an untried, then untried of s prime equals the actions of the state. So what do we think that untried is supposed to be representing? Yeah. The number of actions from this state that we have not yet taken. Yeah. So, so it's going to keep track of all the places we have to still explore from the state. So it's like one aspect of our memory, of our bookkeeping, about where we're, what we're going to do. And, and this is updating, uh, this is um, updating that bookkeeping. So if not s prime, sp in untried, then untried of sp equals, and here's how we get our actions, graph.get sp. <coughs> All right, so now after this, what's s prime going to, what, what's, what's untried uh, going to have? Yep. Sorry, can yeah. Yeah. Um, so we know the actions that we can take in a current state, but we don't know where those actions are going to take are going to take us. So I can ask my my I can call my graph.get, which is the same thing as the small caps actions over here, and get a list of all the actions I can take. But I can't. But, but until I actually take them, I don't know where they're going to they're going to move me to. So, so I'm, I'm in my bus stop in China, and I can see a list of all the buses. And I can, I can do like, you know, string matching to say, OK, these characters mean this bus. And I can wait for it and get on it. But until the bus gets there, I don't know where I'm going to end up. Does that make sense? OK. So when I did my update for untried, it, it, uh, what, what is this actually going to say? What's, what, what, what is true about the actions uh, in my current state in SP? Have I tried any of them? No, no they're all untried, right? So, so it's just dumping them all in there, because I'm in this state, and, and none of them are tried. When do you put the initial state in untried? When do I put the initial state in untried? So the first time I call this function, SP is the initial state. 
and it's and untried is empty, right? So I checked yeah. here. So so I add all of my current so actions. SP is not going to be in untried. The first time I call the function untried is empty. Yeah. So you're not going to get it's at the first base actions. You're not going to put them inside untried. Well, I think this this if not SP. Oh, if not. Okay. Then I think it's going to do it the first time. Yeah. <coughs> Makes sense. All right. So now, if s doesn't equal none. So this is looking back at the last state that I was in. Um, and the first time I run this, my, the last state is none, because my sp is sort of my current uh, node where, where I'm in right now, and I'm, I'm exploring. So uh, what's the next line? What are the next two lines going to do? <coughs> so what's the result? Yeah. So we're recording the fact that if we uh, worked with S and we chose action A, we end up where we are now. Yeah, right. So, so, so what I'm going to do is say result of S A equals S P. And, and that's basically updating, like if I actually took my action, I got to S P and I know that because I'm in S P right now. I get to observe when I'm currently in a state, I can observe that I'm and I can keep track of, of my memory so I know that I was in the last state. So this is kind of updating my, my map of the environment. So, so result, what does result correspond to in our classical search problem? Okay. Not quite. The, the list you have containing all the Well, let's go back to our, our classical search. Um, what, is, what does it correspond to? Transition model. The transition model. Does that make sense? So it's, all, it's kind of called the same thing there. But, but yeah, I'm building up a transition model as I explore the environment. So maybe after I explore, I could use A star to find the optimal, optimal path after I've done this kind of exploration stuff. All right, and this is like my, my step of, of doing that. SD, sorry, SP. All right, <coughs> so what's that? Yes, thank you. All right, add s to the front of unbacktracked of s prime. So what is unbacktracked? Yep. Is it a list of things we have encountered so far that we have not returned to? Yes. Right. So I'm going to keep track of, if I go, so, so this was, I think, the, the thing that you were suggesting. Like, if I keep track of the states that, that I've been in, that still have actions that I can need to keep exploring. So it, so it was basically this stack. So unbacktracked of SP. I think what I'll do is set default um, SP empty list. So, so this is just Python to say, if, if there's nothing in there, make it an empty list. And then I'll say unbacktracked of SP dot append S. Yes. Why is it a list? Because isn't, isn't there only a single place to backtrack for many specific nodes? Like you, you came to a certain node from a certain place. You can't arrive there from multiple different places, can you? Well, if I come back there and I go off and like, 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 let's say that there's a couple of different actions I could take. Like there's three different actions I could take from, from S, and I took one of them and I got to S prime, mm -hmm. and then I, I, you know, I go explore and, I, and that didn't work. So I come back. Now I'm going to take another one. I'm going to visit S again, and take another one of those actions. Does that make sense? Well, you wouldn't want to backtrack down the path you just discovered that you don't want to go down, right? Well, I have to, though, right? Like, like, like so if we look at, at our, oh, sad. <laughs> um, online, let's cheat. Online, DFS. Okay. So um, if I ended up down, down here, yeah. or here, let's say, then I, I want to come back here and, and try some of these other things. And I could visit this node multiple times. So, so I think that's why unbacktrack needs to build up the, the list. Yes? So then how do you know when to remove something from unbacktrack? Like, or do you have a way to like, mark which of the very, could you like, know the different directions you can go from a node? So then oh, let's look at the pseudocode. Like, which direction you've been down? Let's look at the pseudocode. So, um, 
So, so here's where it's popping. I, I'm sorry. Here, so I'll point. It's better, easier than using my mouse. Here's where it's popping unbacktracked. So, um, so, so this is a little bit magical. This is, be, this, is, this is basically saying I have to be able to go backwards, and I have to know how to go backwards. Um, so so it, it's, um, it's knowing which action is going to return me to my previous state. Yes? So if you go down a path to the mm -hmm. dead end and mm -hmm. come back, mm -hmm. you start adding like backtracks, which are really going down towards that dead end again. Right? Because S is not null. You just came from the dead end. Right? Dead end is not null. Mm -hmm. So you add the dead end to the front of unbacktracked S. Isn't there a possibility that you'll, now you look, there's no untried nodes, so you say, oh, I'd better go and check the first of my unbacktracked ones, which brings me back to the dead end. And then the dead end says again, I better untrack. Uh, and, like, if you, why are you putting it at the front of unbacktracked as opposed to, like, at the end of unbacktracked? Um, I think it's because, uh, so add S to the front. If, if, yeah. Because pop gets from the front, right? When you take it later. Yeah, so so I think un un backtracked is a stack. So it's pushing stuff on the stack and then popping it off later. And I think that's basically the depth first search pattern. So you're gonna explore <coughs> that complete branch of the tree. You're gonna go all the way down this branch of the tree before like like you're gonna go all the way to the end before you come back so and, so and come back I'm to this node. You, you hit the end, yeah. you go back one step. Yeah. Right, and now unbacktracked gets added to it the dead end you just visited. So now it's on the top of the stack. So you say, oh, there's no more places I should try. I better backtrack. Thing on the top of your backtrack stack is the dead end you just came from. Well, you just don't add it to the stack. But it, but it says it. if S is not, I'm like, okay. just being this weird. Because it's like there, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a little confused right now. You confuse me. So, so, <laughs> eh. so what I want to have happen is <coughs> the that when it pops unbacktracked, like like that that basically makes up for adding it in the first place. So so basically, I think every time S is not null, which is every time it runs after the first time, it's going to add S to the front of unbacktracked of S prime. And if unbacktracked is ever empty, then it returns stop. And then when it actually picks an action, so, so then it's going to keep pushing in the frontier. So, 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 so it's going to prefer to go down untried. So that says I'm going to keep pushing at the frontier. That's like the depth first thing. Uh, and otherwise, it's going to go back. So, so, so this is basically what's telling it to go backwards. Yeah, but when you, do, when you do yeah. your backtrack, aren't yeah. you not? Let's say you're, you're starting at A and you're going to B and you don't want to have to just hop back and forth from A to A and B and A and B. Mm -hmm. When you get to B and you realize, okay, there's nowhere else to go because you know the path back to A, you know that if you take that path back, you'll get to A. I don't think you push, uh, when you get back to A, I don't think you push B on again. Yeah, like that would make sense. I think, I think, the, reason, this does. I think okay. the reason this works is because you have a stack for each <coughs> tree. Yeah. It's not just one stack that you're keeping your mm -hmm. overall list. Yes. Which is why you're unbacktracked so you won't keep Oh yeah, because S prime is different every time. Yeah, so you're going to be pushing more things on others. You, okay, so you'll be adding to unbacktrack. Thank you. You'll be adding to unbacktrack for other states, but not for the. But but you could still be popping off of unbacktrack for us. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Let's keep coding. Because sometimes because another thing when when you get confused with something like this, a good strategy is just keep coding. And, and somehow, <laughs> and somehow, when the code runs, like you'll, you, you, you can either it'll work, or and and you can add some prints to try to see what's going on, or it won't work, and then you can get into debugging mode to try to figure out what's going on. Yes. S prime is a current state. And yeah. S is the next state. Yes. Oh, the no, S prime. Oh, sorry, no, that's wrong. S prime is the current state that I'm sort of physically in right now, and S and A are the last state. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Previous state. Oh, the previous. Yeah. 
So I just took, I was, I was in state S, I just took, I just took action A, and now I'm in S prime, and I'm trying to pick A prime, okay. essentially. Although they confuse it, they say returning A. Like the A that I'm returning is my A prime if I want to keep my little units consistent. All right, so let's do that. So S prime is appended. So now let's say if untried of S P C is empty, then what? So what's the next thing here? I, I do my unbacktracked check. <coughs> I lost my mouse. Oh, you guys can see the mouse there. So uh, if unbacktracked, unbacktracked, what's that? Yeah, yes. So return stop. That's my shorthand for, for quitting. Is there a faulty value in playback? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I could say if len, uh, if not length of untried of sp, but I think it's clearer to say equals. Um, OK, so then what else? So then this is like that magical step where I'm going to pop unbacktracked. So a equals, so what I did in my example was um, kind of a hack related to the fact that my states and my actions are almost the same thing. So let's find it. Um, I basically just defaulted to popping it right back off without doing this check. So, yes? Where? Yeah. Here? No, one line down. One line down. Yes. Oh, that's why you guys asked that question. Not, yeah. yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I, so, so I could say not length, but, but I really like to say equal equal zero. I get confused otherwise. Then you have to remember that Python thinks zeros are false, and that's that's the whole thing. All right. And then I'm going to pop back to my. Um, I'm going to look at the actions that haven't been tried at this node. So I'm going to pick an action by, um, by getting the actions that were untried for this load and popping something off. So the first time I run this, what, what are we going to do? Like, what path are we going to take through this if tree? Let me make it. Sorry. I want you to see the whole function. So here's two's action. So the first time I run this, what's going to happen? <coughs> you're at the goal, you're really stop. Mm -hmm. Let's say I'm not at the goal. Yeah, that's good, though. Yeah, if I'm at the goal, I'll stop. So, so, let's, so, that's, so that's, that's a good strategy. We can kind of evaluate it in our heads. So now, if not SP is in untried, is that going to be true the first time? <coughs> you said it was, yeah. All right, uh, if s doesn't equal none, so the first time it will equal none, so we just we don't have to even think about unbacktracked. Yay. Um, all right, so is this going to be true or false? Is the length of untried sp going to be zero or not zero? Well, what happened up here? Hopefully it's not zero, yeah. So we don't, we don't, we don't know kind of, let's say we're actually going to do it in the graph that we were in. So, so we do know the next actions in that state. Then, then, then what will happen? What will this be? It'll be false. Everybody see that? So we're going to, up here, we're going to add the next actions for our current state. So down here, when we run this check, there, unless we're in a dead end world and the whole thing breaks down, if we're in a dead end world, then um, we're going to, we're going to be uh, not in this state. So, what we're gonna, what, so what does this say that we're going to do? How are we going to pick our actions? We're just going to pick one. It doesn't, it's sort of whatever order they came out of the graph, we're going we're gonna to go and, and do that to pick, to pick the next action. Does that make sense? OK. All right, and then there's some bookkeeping we have to do. So. Um, so we have so they, so they say s equals s prime, but I'm doing this by passing it back out. So we're just going to return sp and we're going to return a 
the action that we picked. And then it's going to go off and, and pick that action. So let's try, see if it works. <coughs> Online DFS u.py. All right, so we think it's going to pick a node and, and go. And I'm printing out the result untried and, and unbacktracked. So here, it, so here it picked this node over here. And um, he, so here is our untried after doing that. So, so what this is saying is that 0, 0, that's where I was at the beginning. Um, there were three things I could do, right? So, so what was untried? So this is untried after my first jump. What was untried? Uh, the first, like, like the first, it was empty. What was it? The yeah. It had five negative two at I guess the front of the pool. That's right. It had one more thing, that that five negative two action. And then we decided to take that. We just popped it off. And so now our untried is is one less. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wait, so is the outer loop just kind of probing all? Because you don't know. You only have a transition model. So when your add starts, you first visit all of these guys to get what they are, and then decide an action. No, those are well, that's we that 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 was going to be like breadth first. Oh, okay. So so we we know at start, <laughs> we know that we could do let's say action one, action two and action three. But we don't know that if we take action one, we don't know that we'll be at this location, which is like, what, two, three, one, probably. Negative three, ne yeah, thank you. Negative three, negative one. We don't know that until we actually take the action. So here we took action one. And once we've taken it, now we know that that's going to put us at five, two, five, negative two. Does that make sense? Yes. So in, in, in untried, you have negative three, negative one, and one, two. And the only way you would have found those values based on the actions from the start is if you actually took those actions, right? Yeah. So, so this, I, I, honestly, I have to apologize about this. So, so this is related to the way that I am representing what an action actually is. So I, if, I, if I, I don't know, if I was making this more clear, what this should actually say is action one and action two. And you wouldn't actually know, the, the program doesn't actually know these numbers. It just thinks of this as action one and action two. To, to, but we, like, because as I said, this isn't simulation, this isn't a real robot going off and doing stuff. Um, we know that if you took action one, that's where you would end up. And if you took action two, um, this is where you would end up. So, so maybe in some ways it makes it clear because we get more intuition about what untried is, what the meanings of those actions are. Uh, but from the perspective of the algorithm, it does not know. If it didn't know, we would be back in A star land, and we, and, we could, and we could jump around and teleport. OK? Cool. Any more questions? So what do we think is going to happen next? Can we try another guy? Go forward or go yes. down? Yeah. I think so. I, well, so, so something that was, yeah, I think it should, go, it should keep pushing, pushing down. It was trying to pick one, and it's yeah. going, going back to the goal yeah. position. It is, it's in there, and we're supposed to take over. Yeah. What's going to happen to our, what do we want to have happen? So, so I just coded this now. I haven't tested it yet. So what, what we think will happen may not be what actually happens. W what do we want to happen to our result? Yeah. Zero, zero, when you take the yeah. action, which we are calling zero, but the action that's actually, I guess, five, negative two, yeah. end up at five, negative two. That's right. So our result should be updated with our, with our map of the environment. So let's see. Let's hit enter <coughs> and see where it goes. Oh, it went back. So let's check, let's check our result. So does this make sense? <coughs> yeah. So I was at zero, zero. And I took action number six, which I, or number one, which is labeled five, negative two. And that put me to the state 5, negative 2. OK? So this is sort of recording my transition matrix as I, as I explore the world. Cool. All right. So untried. So what's an untried? So, so, I, so, so far, I was at 0, 0, and I have the same thing from before. So, so what have I added to untried? The other action, right. So I, so I was here, and I, I could take action one or action two. I could take an action to go back and an action to go forward. So I actually think it's kind of OK that it went back, because it doesn't know that going back, is go we know going back goes back. But it doesn't know that until it actually does go back. Does that, does that make sense? 
Yeah, I see heads nodding. Yes? And so it essentially made that trace to go to zero, zero arbitrary. Yes. Yeah. It's because of the order that the, the vertices were in the graph. Yeah, in this, in this case, because of the order that I coded up the, the vertices in the graph. So does that yeah. have to learn that this action goes back? Yes. So what does it mean to learn that? But what, what, what data structure is getting updated as we learn that? Result. 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 Yeah, so our result. So what's <laughs> going to happen to result the next time if, if the code is correct? Five, two, zero, zero, zero. Yeah, so let's see. Does that, does that work? So zero, zero, I take five, two, I end up in five, two. Five, two, zero, 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 zero. So I'm learning my forwards and my backwards. Yeah? How does it know, how could it ever get back? Yeah. To, oh, no, unbacktrack, so it could, it could backtrack to 5, negative 2. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's how it would end up trying. That's how it would ever do it. It's, it's, it's yeah. not that it explored it, it's that it would have to go. go since it, it accidentally backtracked, then it would have to backtrack to back. To back, to back tra the backtrack, yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> Yes. So sorry, could you re explain the role of unbacktrack? Okay. Yeah. All right, so let's see. So our unbacked, I think actually what might be good is to just see what happens. Oh, it, it went up there now. When it, when it uses unbacktracked. So what I'll do is, is put a big lot of noise here. Print using unbacktracked. And then let's try to, to figure out what happens if that person ever gets called. So we're kind of bouncing around. <coughs> no, I think it's still ex OK. Here we go, using unbacktracked. So there's a lot of things going on. So maybe this will be hard to do live in class. Uh, but let's take a look. So here is the state of all my variables when I went in <laughs> with a lot of stuff in my little map. Uh, and I'm and I'm using unbacktracked now. So my length of untried for my current state. So let's first of all let's see where where I was and what I was doing. So my current state right now where I am is in zero zero, and I was in over uh, one and up two. So I was up here. Okay. And what did I do? So I went. So I checked if I wasn't at the goal. I wasn't. And then. I checked if SP was an untried. Well, was I already at <laughs> zero, 00 before? Yeah, I was my start state, so before I was. All right, S doesn't equal none. So now I look and uh, I, I update my, my results table so even, um, to say that I've already been <coughs> there and this is what happened. And then I update my unbacktracked. And then my, my untried of SP equals zero. Okay, so here's what happened. I was, I, I was at my start state, and I've tried all the actions here. Right? I've been in my start node three times, and I tried each of those actions one time. So my length of untried of SP is zero. Does that make sense? So now I'm going to check uh, in, in, in backtracked. So backtracked of zero, zero. Is, wait, oh here it is. Okay, so here, here, here we can see it, right? So this is an untried. My, my untried nodes for this is empty. So now I'm going to look in my unbacktrack nodes. And basically, um, I'm going to just pull something off of unbacktrack. So what that says I'm going to do is, is go back to um, one of the, the nodes that I, that I was at from, from this node and go revisit it. Because there's still some untried nodes for, th for those nodes. D does, that, does that make sense? Yes? I'm a little confused by the 5, negative 2 being on backtrack. Like, didn't we go there and then go back to 0, 0? Well, look at, look at um, what's in untried for 5, negative 2. Yeah, so I mean, it still has things. But the, how do we define like, unbacktrack? Does that just mean it went back along the path you came to it, or you haven't backtracked? I think it means that there's still nodes that, that are not tried. So if we go back there, we'll, we'll go into our untried and we'll get to new territory that we haven't explored before. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So it's gonna, we might have to revisit places, but it's going to force us to kind of explore our world and hopefully eventually reach the goal. Yes? That's basically what we're doing, yeah. So I mean, like, when you, on the yeah. first step, when you went to 5, negative 2, and yep. then you went back to negative, you already visited? Mm -hmm. So we just know that we go back. Yeah. You just know that there were yeah. two actions. You don't know which like one would take you back. You didn't know where the second yeah. pilot came in. It just happened to be the other direction. Yeah, it just happened to be the bus that was the other, other direction. Yeah. So, so maybe if I, if I, if I, if I, maybe if I had picked a better example, I, it would have kept going to the end. It sort of, it, it, it's happened to be the order of the expanded notes. Does that make sense? So it didn't know it was going to go back until it actually got back there. Yes? I guess, like I, what she's saying is yeah. when it looks to see that all the nodes is that there are three un, un, you know, unvisited nodes, two, two belong to the, like, the node that we had just been, or it didn't know that we had just been there, but two are two hops away and one is one hop away. It doesn't even know that it right. could get to an unvisited node closer than um, I, I guess I'm not understanding the question. Uh, so, so when we yeah. were at the, the first hop it did, yeah. I realized that at that point it knows that there are untried nodes. That, um, you said the first node that hops, hops off in the graph order yeah. has, has untried nodes. Yeah. So it ranks those first, and that's why it goes back. Yeah, I think it's nodes that are connected directly to it. That it, that it, so it's not using the cost of, of, of graph traversal to figure it out. So it's, it's just using a node. So, so of the nodes that are one hop away, where, which one should I, should I go to, to to keep trying things? Yeah? Could we do better by like codifying um, actions that are uh, the opposite of other actions? So, so we could be more biased towards exploring? Yeah, so like, like we would know if uh, if we took action one, the mm -hmm. first step, mm -hmm. we would we at the other node we would know which one of the two actions is the the opposite of that other action. You, you mean like in the opposite them, in the opposite one direction? Them, one of them must be the the backtracking action. I think what you're talking about is like putting in more domain knowledge mm -hmm. about what these actions do. Yeah. And, and, I th and I think the answer is yes. If we put that knowledge into the, into the search <coughs> process, then it would know more things. Um, but the, the sort of challenge, uh, I, I don't, what, what this is really doing is, 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 is modeling the problem where we don't have that knowledge. Um, so maybe it w what might be good to do is, is to think more about, uh, yes, question? A good way to visualize it yeah. might be to say that instead of one path being two ways, it's two one-way paths that each yeah. lead in yeah. one direction. And you don't actually have any knowledge of the, of the path going in the other direction when you take the path going in one yeah. direction. I was, I was thinking like a robot. Like a, mm -hmm. if a robot, you say, take five steps forward, mm -hmm. you could have it, like, it could know that five steps backwards. Yes. Is the opposite. Yes. Of what do. So, it, yes. It, it so we could know how to revert. Is a backtrack yes. Action. Yes. If you're not working with paths, that might not be the same. What yeah. if you're yeah. moving the block around? Yeah. The so representations of where the state goes, you might not be able to move the block back to the other path the same yeah. way you moved. The but but I still I really like the way you're thinking about this. So 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 even though for the purposes of like you know, we're in class and we want to talk about online algorithms and stuff. We're artificially almost imposing these limitations on ourselves. When you're actually working on AI problems, the way that you're thinking is exactly the way you want to be thinking, which is, you know, if the problem is too hard to solve, what additional information can I add to the problem to make it easier so that I actually can solve it? That, that art is, is a lot of what is involved in making systems work in practice. So I like, I like the way that you're thinking. It's a good, it's a good example of, of almost what's really important. Like these algorithms are fun and all, but it's almost what's really important about this is to try to think about, like, am I in online space and is there a way to get out of it? Is there a way to add additional information and, and help me do better? So, so actually related to that, there was an exercise, I think I skipped it over, that I wanted to do. We've been doing this sort of work of, uh, uh, in class of having you guys turn and, and, and define classical search problems, um, why don't we take some time now in, in that vein and, and, and come up with, uh, like turn to the person sitting next to you, and come up with an online problem 
where you really, in, in, if we're, like, so, so one example we've been talking about is our little robot that, that can't go backwards, um, where you really don't have the ability to know the transition matrix. And, and then I'm going to ask you to tell me why it's hard to find out the transition matrix um, for, for the problem that you, that you defined. So why don't you guys turn to each other and, and do that. <coughs> All right, guys. Why don't we come back? Yeah? Protein folding. Why don't, why don't we, why don't we, quiet, quiet. Protein folding. Yeah, so you don't, so you're like looking to get the like, the lowest energy mm -hmm. fold. Mm -hmm. So you have different steps that you can take. Um, I don't know a lot about protein folding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So you would have to, you can't just like mm -hmm. transport from one state to another. You would have to like fold it back to figure out which mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. it would go to. Yeah, so this is a really interesting example. So, so protein folding, there's, there's a lot of work, like there's, a, there's that folding at home thing, right? Where, where people are basically searching through the space of all the different ways you could fold the protein. It's a space you can think about exhaustively enumerating. So, so you can think about having T. But why might you want to pretend that you don't have T? So, so the other part of the question is, why don't you have the, the transition matrix, the result matrix? It's too big. It's too big, yeah. So if, if the search space is so big that you can't, you can't encode it, or it would be too big to search it, sometimes you can do better by these, these algorithms. And, and, so some of the, and, and so these simulated annealing types of, of, of approaches Simulating annealing, I think, actually came from like annealing is like a protein thing, like like um, uh, uh, simulating what what these chemical things actually do when they're actually going out there and and, and folding themselves. So that's nice. Uh, example I thought of that I'm actually not even sure if it works, but I know it goes against the mm -hmm. oh, you can figure out if you can mm -hmm. go back or not. Uh, navigating a shoots and ladders board. Okay, navigating a shoots and ladders board. Okay. Uh, and why don't you have the transition matrix? Uh, I mean, you might have the transition. Yep. I'm looking for problems where, where you couldn't have it, oh, and it, like, or, or, or it's difficult to have it. And, I mean, and I want you to tell me why you think it's difficult to have it. But, I, but I, you know, it's, 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 I, I, it's, it's okay. And I think what's nice about it is it's analogous to this example here, where we kind of pretended not to have it for the sake of, of explaining I the algorithm was doing. backtracking one. You, yeah. you can't backtrack by just saying, oh, yeah. I just did. Yeah, so the algorithm that we, that we wrote um, won't work. We have to do something different. Yes? Here's a sort of very theoretical and a bit bizarre one, but a series of groups of teleporter pads. <laughs> you have no idea where each one of those pads goes, and you have no idea if, once you've got on one of those pads, one of the new pads <laughs> in the new place will take you back to where you were. You can tell where you are, maybe this giant number painted on the floor or something. Uh -huh. But other than that, you really have no idea where you're going to end up until you've gone there. Yeah. <laughs> so why don't you have the transition matrix? Because you have no idea where any of these things are. Yeah, you don't know the map, the map of the environment. Yeah. OK, so you've got a crazy website where you try okay. to build a site map. OK. And this is the link to the URL shortener. Yep. So it's like bit.ly or something, so you don't actually know where it goes. And also, there's a crazy GS GSRF thing so that you can't, like, as soon as you go to one link, all the other links are invalidated. Uh huh. 
<laughs> so, so, so you don't. So, so, you guys are giving me a lot of examples with not backtracking. Um, what you don't, you can have online search with <coughs> backtracking, or you can have it without backtracking. So, um, and and this algorithm that we're talking about, they, it doesn't work if there if there is not backtracking. You have to have backtracking, or else you're in big trouble because you're you're gonna get you're gonna go off a cliff and you'll be stuck. You can't you can't climb back up um, until the end. Uh, so, so in your example, let's let's just focus on on. Let's assume that, <laughs> that they're not going to change the URLs once we once we follow them. There must be cost to go backwards, right? So there could still be a cost to go backwards, yeah. But there's some action that I can take that 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 moves me back. So let's say I click the back button on my browser or something, and the link well, is going to yeah, there's, there's a back link, but yeah, you, you actually have to click the back link. Yeah, you can't, like you go to the back link because otherwise you'd be able to like, rewind to any prior state. Without having to go through each individual like node, essentially. Yes, you're right. Instead, you've yeah. Got the so you actually, yeah, you're right. You're right. You, so you had, we could do it either way, actually. Like we, you could say that you could click the back button. What would that mean if we had the back button about our state transition matrix? Well, if you had the back button, then you'd be able to back multiple times in one go. And anyway, if if you had a back button, then yeah, you it would just be each path would have. It would mean our state space is changing based on what we searched, right? Because because our back button would depend on are, are sort of the nodes that we had we had traversed on. Yeah. 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 All right. Why don't you guys give me one more from the middle? We had some from the sides. Karthik. Robot searching for an object. Searching. Or object, and why don't I have the transition function? You don't have, anymore. You don't have a map of the environment in advance. <coughs> yeah. All right. So um, what I was going to do in the uh, in class, but I guess we, I guess DFS was was more, more was was uh, more confusing than I thought. Uh, was was talk about heuristic online search as well. So so just like there there's sort of a star search in an offline setting, there's an online version of A star, where I'm basically updating my heuristic estimate based on the examples of, of how long it actually takes to, to, to go from, from that state to the next state. Um, so it's the same kind of, uh, the same flavor of, of algorithm as our Bradford search, where at each time step, where we have some persistent stuff, and at each time step, we're choosing an action. But the bookkeeping is a little bit different, because what we're doing is updating this h here, which is a table of our, of our cost estimates. So once we've taken these actions, we can estimate, we can give a better version of our heuristic based on our observations about how, far, uh, about how much our cost uh, can be as we, as we move through the environment. So I'm not going to go um, and, and implement this, because I don't think we have time. But I want you to know that it exists. So um, you can, and it's also interesting, what's interesting about both of these algorithms, both the, the, breadth, the depth for search and, and the A star search, is that they're both, you can think of them as learning algorithms. They both have a state, uh, a notion of a state that they're updating. And, and, and they're incorporating this knowledge about the environment into their decisions in order to make better decisions. As they as they move over time, so these agents are trying to by 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 doing these updates, they're trying to improve their performance over time, and this this kind of um, learning and, and updating is going to be uh, a theme as we as we move on to um, the the next units in the course in probability and in and in reinforcement learning. So we're just starting to see that here. Um, all right. So the other thing I wanted to talk about. So here's classical search, is um, other ways of breaking classical search, other ways of making this search problem harder. And, and we actually, um, the example that you gave about the web pages where, um, where the, 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 the you have some kind of adversary that's changing the, the, the structure of the website underneath you. Um, th that's, that's a really nice example of a, of a way that breaks classical search. So somebody want to tell me why that example where this person is like, Changing your website. Why that isn't the same as classical search. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, you, it, it's actually, so, so the, the one that I was thinking about is, is non-deterministic action search, 
Uh, but this is a little bit different. Um, so so um, what's happening is that your transition model isn't staying the same over time. Okay. So so even um, like so in local search you don't know it, um, but we still assume that like the world like like it's like it's like I forget what they call it in physics where you're like the same thing done here. Like if I drop the ball, gravity is going to work over here, and if I come over here and I drop the ball, gravity is going to keep working. Um, here we're we're kind of breaking gravity, right? Or in this example that, that you came up with, the, the the transition matrix that we learned back then, when we get back to the state now, it might not be any good anymore, right? So, so we have to figure out how to update our memories and, and our knowledge based on this sort of changing environment. So anybody want to think of other examples or ways that we could break the classical search problem? And there's one we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail. But yes? You could just randomly, when you take an action, you end up somewhere else. Like, there's a possibility of failure. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that, yes, that's great. So this is the one that I, that I was going to talk about. It's called non-deterministic action search, where you know, you don't know what your transition matrix is. You, 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 you don't know what's going to happen when you take an action. And there might be like real non-determinism there. So like you flip a coin, and if you're going to take an action number one, and you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you're in state one, and if it's tails, you're in state two. And if you take action number two, then you flip a coin, and if it's heads, you're in state three, and if it's tails, you're in state four. So there's like this tree of possible outcomes for what could happen. Um, let me draw that. So I'm in a state here, my, my start state. I take an action one, or I could take action two. And then the world happens. Like, I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> Something magical. And uh, the outcome is that I could be in state S2 here, let's say. And here's state S3. And here's state S4. And here's state S5. So my action still matters. Even, like, I mean, maybe it doesn't. In really pathological environments, maybe my action doesn't even matter. Like, the world just ignores me and, and <laughs> teleports me. Yeah, but, 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 but in a lot of cases, the, the, my action could still matter. So an example of this might be I'm a robot, and I'm going to pick up an object. And with some probability, it'll succeed. And with some probability, it'll fall out of my hands. It's still worth trying to pick up an object, because hopefully I'll succeed, right? But there's, but there's uncertainty about that. And what I have to do is act in a, in a, in a, in a way that will, cause the, like, in the end of the day, cause the right thing to happen. So, um, so what this looks like formally is that our transition model here is returning lots of results, right? So I might not know, I don't get one state that I'm going to end up in after I take that action. I get a bunch of states. And in the more general version, the book doesn't talk about the most general version where you actually have probabilities associated with which of these states you're in. But you just, you just don't know. Maybe there's a uniform probability. There's, there's some set of states. So what's different about the solution to the search problem in this, in this non-deterministic case versus the deterministic case? <coughs> so, so what's the solution look like in the deterministic case? Like, um, uh, like what does it mean? If I'm thinking about path planning and stuff, what's the solution look like? Yes? It's like if you do these actions, you will get certain results. Yes. Yeah. So, it's a, so, 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 so here's the this classical search, as well as say. Classical search. So it says if I do A1, and then I do A2, and then I do A3, and then I do some more things, then I get A sub K, let's say, and then I will be at the goal. And I'd be, I'm a happy, I'm a happy little AI. I I maybe could, but it's non-deterministic, right? So it, there may be, it, I, I could take an action with some probability that moves me back to state S0. And with some probability, moves me to some other state, teleports me randomly somewhere else. Keep trying the highest probability. Um, so what? It, so so let's say that I. So so yeah. let's. So that's one solution. Is, is I could just kind of randomly pick actions, and I like coming back to that solution because it's. Uh, I fixed the clock, by the way. That clock is now accurate, unless. 
somebody change it in the meantime. I fixed it after last class. So I, I really do have three more minutes, and I apologize for keeping you late previous times. Um, so I think that um, acting randomly will, will kind of work, and that you'll, you'll get an agent that's not just going to sit in the corner and, and do stuff. But the distinction I wanted to, to get at is a, is a little bit more. So imagine that um, in every state, there is, are some actions better than other actions in that state? Yeah, yeah there are. Um, but if I, if, I, if, I, if I try to do my classical search problem in, in this world, I take action A1, and then, and then let's say it sends me to state S2, and then I take action A2, what's going to go wrong? You might not be able to make A2. I might not even be able to make A2. A2 might not make any sense at all anymore. That's right. So, but is, it, but is, if, is there still an action that's in, a, in, in S that's better? So let's say A4, A5, and A6. Is it the case that there's probably a better action and, and worse actions? Yeah, there are. So, so if I want to encode that, what does that look like? It's a tree, yeah. So does that make sense, everybody? So, so instead of just being a list of actions, it's like a tree. A1, and then if I'm at state S1, then I should do A2. And if I'm at state S2, then I should do A3. And it kind of goes down like that. And it's basically like this if st bunch of if statements. If this happens, I do this. If that happens, I do that. So the difference here is, is between a plan and a policy. This first thing, the sequence of actions where I just close my eyes and hope. Um, this classical search is going to tell us what to do. I'm just going to do A1, A2, A3, A4. This is called a plan. This thing over here where for any state that I'm in, it's going to tell me the best action to take in that state is called a policy. So it's this much more powerful thing because no matter where I am, it's going to tell me something that I should do. So, so when we get to this harder problem, we have something, uh, we have a more complicated solution, but it's also a more powerful solution. So next time we're going to talk more about remixing search. We'll talk about adversarial search. The new homework is out, and my office hours are after class today if you have any questions. When is the next homework? The next homework is due, I believe it's due a week from today. No. Uh, no. Wednesday. Oh, Wednesday. Wednesday. Oh, because of the, yes, because of the holiday this weekend. So we're giving you a few extra days on the homework. Hey. I just asked a question about the packing list. I can't really go to office hours right now. Okay. But um, for the corner part of it, yep. um, do, you, do you think I just draw on the board real quick? Sure.